to keep current on um, the publications, university publications, especially lethal bronzing disease. Some of this may not be so new, but hopefully it'll be a good refresher for you. Whoops. All right, Amy, I was just gonna jump in and, and say they should see the poll results on their screen. We okay. have 45% uh, have uh, somewhat, are somewhat familiar with lethal bronzing. And then in second place is vaguely at 30%. Um, and then some folks, about 25% feel like they're very um, familiar. Nobody has never heard of it before, so that's good. Good. Uh, and then <laughs> we have an overwhelming majority of participants, 80% are Master Gardener volunteers. So don't feel um, too concerned about the techno speak. Uh, we have a couple of interested homeowners, one extension agent, one garden club member, and one municipal employee. So Excellent. diversity. Thank uh, you very much indeed. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So um, this is Dr. Brian Bader. Um, he is an assistant professor of vector entomology at the university's um, Fort Lauderdale Research and Education Center. And the material that I'm going to be presenting today is based on what he presented at the summit last year. And here's the binder that came with the lecture. <laughs> Um, Dr. Bader has been working the last uh, five years or so on identifying the vector, the insect vector, that is the insect that carries lethal bronzing disease. And he's got a big old net there, which we were laughing about this the other day. The insect vector, the alleged insect vector, I should say, is a very teeny tiny uh, plant hopper that's about two tenths of an inch long. So he's got plenty of net there for that little guy. Um, the, the, uh, the summit was an all-day meeting. It covered uh, symptoms of the disease, history of the disease. We talked about um, how they were investigating, uh, identifying the vector. Also, we talked about um, how to uh, apply uh, antibiotic injections to prevent the disease, and also how to do trunk sampling, and then, of course, lastly, control and management. I'm not gonna go into every single one of those things with you today, you'll be relieved to hear, but um, we'll hit the highlight film. The, uh, the, the attendees at the summit, it was open to the public, um, but the, the attendees were largely comprised of landscape professionals. Uh, there were some extension agents, some scientists, arborists, two master gardeners, myself included, as well as a member of the public. So it was a very interesting, very interesting seminar and we learned an awful lot of new news which is what we'll cover today. There is a new host range, host range meaning the species of palms that are susceptible to lethal bronzing disease or have tested positively, I should say, for lethal bronzing disease. And that is a list now of 16 different species, up significantly from several years ago. Um, also how they are zeroing in on the vector, the insect vector, where the lethal bronzing uh, disease dwells in the trunk and foliage, and then the optimal time to remove disease palms to prevent the spread. So what is lethal bronzing disease? Just as a refresher, um, lethal bronzing disease is a fatal disease of palms. There is no cure. Once a palm gets it, uh, it's history. It's pretty much curtains. It used to be called Texas Phoenix Palm Decline, or TPPD, because it was first described in Texas first reported on Phoenix genus of palms. And that of course has changed. It's now no longer in Texas and no longer just confined to the date palm genus, Phoenix. Um, Dr. Bader is the one who named it lethal bronzing disease and that refers to the characteristic bronze coloration of the foliage once it dies uh, in this disease. And he does admit that um, it's kind of a misnomer because there's another fatal disease of palms called Ganoderma butt rot that has quite similar bronze coloration of the old foliage, but there's some other big distinctions there. So um, lethal bronzing it is. Uh, it is caused by a phytoplasma. Phytoplasmas are a group of bacteria without cell walls. That means they cannot survive outside of a living plant or insect. And that's kind of good news and bad news. The bad news is you can't culture it in artificial media, so you have to study it in a living host. That's not terribly convenient. And then, you know, the, on the good news side, though, it is, cannot be spread mechanically. You cannot spread it on gardening tools, which is great because there's several fungal diseases we know 
that do spread on gardening tools, but this is not a disease that will spread that way. Interestingly enough too though, um, since palm trees can't be grafted like broadleaf trees can be, uh, they, if you had a diseased palm in the same landscape next to a healthy palm and the roots are touching underground, LBD, as we call it, cannot be spread that way. So no mechanical, no mechanical spread at all, so that's, that's a plus. It was discovered in Florida in 2006. Dr. Bader believes that it came in courtesy of Hurricane Wilma in 2005. Wilma made a pass over the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico before hitting, in, hitting the uh, Florida Peninsula. And this phytoplasma is a native of that area of the Yucatan Peninsula. So that is his theory. Ground zero was um, Hillsborough County. You have not developed cataracts. I'm sorry, I apologize for the poor resolution on this, on this particular graphic. I could not download a higher res graphic. Uh, obviously, this is a county map of Florida. The, the counties that are in red are those from which Dr. Bader has received tr uh, palm trunk tissue that has tested positive for lethal bronzing disease. So starting at your far left, that's 2008, it spread from Hillsborough to Manatee and Sarasota counties. Five years on in 2013, we now see it pretty much in all of Central Florida. And by 2018, five years later, it has now moved to Southern Florida. Um, what's kind of new in, on this 2018 map is Jefferson County up there in the Panhandle. And also I believe um, St. John's County is new on this map. Now that little donut hole, right here. That is Hendry and Glade counties. Whoops. Whoops. And um, just because it, the reason why that, that that's in white is because he has not received infected trunk tissue from those two counties. There was a participant at our a summit who is from Hendry County and he said, oh yeah, we've got it, no doubt. So, um, so that, that's his positive identification there. Um, Louisiana and South Carolina have also tested positive for um, lethal bronzing disease in certain palms. So this is the list of counties. There are 31 counties now with confirmed cases of LBD. And um, it's interesting because uh, the spread has not been as rampant to the north of the state as it has been to the south. And there are probably a couple of reasons for that. Number one, in the south of Florida, there are more different palm species because it's just a warmer climate. So more opportunities, if you will, for the disease. And then also the, um, the alleged vector, its lifespan is impacted by the weather. So the cooler the weather, the shorter the lifespan of the alleged vector. Um, so that might be one of the reasons why this uh, you know, shapes, shapes out like it does. But in any case, Dr. Bader says, this disease will be distributed any place a cabbage palm, a sable palmetto will survive because that's one of their favorite trees. Just basics on palm construction, we'll be using these terms uh, interchangeably. Uh, palm trees are monocots, they have one seed leaf. So uh, really they don't have a trunk. It's not like a true trunk, like on a broadleaf tree, but we do tend to call it a trunk. It's technically a stem. The, uh, the, the green lollipop on the top is technically the crown, but we typically refer to it as canopy. Now up here, this is the spear leaf. That is the newest emerged leaf. We call it a spear leaf because it looks like a spear. It hasn't unfurled yet. Um, there's only ever one newest leaf on a palm. Now in many cases, you will look at some palms, like foxtail is a typical example, and you go, wait, Amy, that's got two spear leaves. Well, no, it doesn't. It just has a newest leaf and a next newest leaf or vice versa. In other words, one has just not completely unfurled before a new, a new leaf has emerged. The apical meris stem right here in the center of the palm that is called the bud, the heart, or the growing point of the palm. Uh, once the apical meris stem is damaged or diseased and it dies, the palm dies. Unlike broadleaf trees, um, there's only one meristem on a palm. The whole leaf, the whole frond of the palm is called a leaf. That is one individual leaf and those little green things coming off are called leaflets. 
Now, when we talk about old and new leaves in a canopy, the bottom half of the canopy or crown is typically the old part. Those are the oldest leaves. The upper part of the canopy is the newest leaves that, that are emerging from the apical meristem. Okay, when you're diagnosing, as master gardeners, when you're diagnosing lethal bronzing disease for customers, um, the first thing you wanna do is eliminate nutritional deficiencies first. For those of you who have taken any of my palm classes, you will know that I repeat ad nauseum <laughs> that a palm is much more likely to suffer, altogether now, a palm is much more likely, likely to suffer from and die of nutritional deficiencies than diseases or pest insects. Diseases and pest insects are somehow glamorous because they're often fatal, they're often fast, they're often dramatic. I mean, you know, the entire canopy sometimes just drops to the ground. But truthfully, um, you're gonna, what you're gonna find mostly in palm tree is, issues is gonna be a nutritional one. Now, that doesn't mean it's mutually exclusive. It could have LBD as well as nutritional deficiencies, but just so you know, the place to start is nutrition. So for example, the, palm, the royal palms on the left of your screen, those are classic K, that's potassium deficiency. You can see the pencil pointing on some of those trunks in the background and the, the, you know, the death, the necrosis in the lower part of the old leaves. The uh, queen palm on the right, that was in my neighborhood, not my palm, I'm happy to say. I watched the um, homeowner uh, systemically prune live leaves off of this tree and it subsequently died of malnutrition. You can see that poor spear leaf at the very top trying to hang on for dear life. This process took about four months, I would say, from the time he finished doing this pruning to death. Uh, lethal bronzing disease can be just as quick, but in a situation like this, probably the nutrients would get to it first. Okay, so uh, long about a year, maybe a year and a half ago, Dr. Bader started giving a series of interviews to the media and press releases went out on his progress with lethal bronzing disease. And so we started having, it became very topical. We started having a lot of homeowners show up at our plant clinic or call us up on our, on our you know, phone and say, uh, God, does my palm have LBD? Look at these pictures, you know? So again, uh, we had to make sure, you know, ground ourselves and say, let's make sure it's not a nutritional thing first. But then the next question you really need to ask is, what kind of palm is it? Is it in the known host range for lethal bronzing disease? Um, back when lethal bronzing disease first uh, came into Florida, it was impacting only a handful, maybe four or five different species. Now it has extended to 16. But again, if you go back to your your royal palm, royal palm is not on that list yet. But so the first thing you can do, you can probably eliminate lethal bronzing because it's not on that host list. It hasn't been confirmed as having the disease, as carrying the disease. And then next you wanna say, what symptoms does it have? And can you describe the sequence of those symptoms? This is very, very tough. Um, eyewitness accounts are very inaccurate usually. If, you're, if your homeowner customer has pictures, that's super helpful and can give you timelines. You know, that's super helpful. But um, really and truly, it, it can be difficult to diagnose unless you have a progression of the symptoms. So let's talk about that known host range uh, species for lethal bronzing. There are 16, 13 identified in the US, in Mexico, an additional three. So this includes the lovely Adenidia morelli, that little Christmas palm, a lovely little palm um, for landscapes, the Bismarck palm, the Pindo palm, Carpentaria palm, which is uh, really, really uh, popular in South Florida, as well as coconut palms down there, Chinese fan palm, and then we get into our Phoenix species. So Canary Island date, the Medjool date, the Pygmy date, and the Wild date. Now note who is missing from this list, the Reclinata. The Phoenix Reclinata, the Senegal date palm, has not ever tested positive for lethal bronzing disease. Weird. It's, the, it's one of the only clumping palms in the Phoenix species, but I don't know if that has anything to do with it. Not, we don't know. Uh, followed by the cabbage palm, our venerable state tree. <laughs> and then comes um, the uh, queen palm, not surprising. And then the windmill palm, that lovely native cold hardy palm, windmill palm. Now you notice there's a couple of asterisks here. 
by the Bismarcki Nobilis and the Lipstona Chinensis. There has only ever been one individual case that Dr. Bader has tested positive for LBD. It's kind of an anomaly. He has seen Bismarckias growing in uh, high disease areas in nurseries and have, they've been unaffected. He has seen uh, Livestona chinensis growing in nurseries, stands of Chinese fan palms growing among stands of Sylvester palms, you know, the, the wild date palm that have LBD not affecting the Chinese fan palm. Um, he's actually seen the Chinese or the uh, Chinese fan palm covered in the alleged insect vector and they have not been affected. So it's hard to say what happened here. Was it a testing error? Was it a sampling error? Is it simply that this little bug doesn't like the taste of Bismarck and Chinese fan palms? We don't know. It, it's, it's a big unknown. Um, the uh, one thing that, you know, I asked Dr. Bader last year, I said, okay, what is, you know, what are some common characteristics? Can we, can we state with any degree of certainty what palm might be susceptible and what palm might not be? And we cannot do that. There's just, there's no, um, not enough information at this point about what palm might be more susceptible. He, he thinks that, you know, one kind of theory out there might be the way the leaflet attaches to the petiole or the midrib. Those of you who remember from your palm class, in duplicate, reduplicate attachment, the way it attaches to the petiole, to the petiole, um, the way the little pleat goes, the, maybe the tighter the little pleat, maybe the more the bug likes it because it can hide better. But these are things that we just, we just really don't know at this point. Uh, of the palms on this list, the most pressure we're seeing is of course on cabbage palms. Uh, you probably have seen cabbage palms out in undisturbed areas that are dying of this disease. And it's, it's a total, it's a disease that jumps from, it jumps randomly. So you can drive out into kind of the, the, the hinterland out here and you can see a dead cabbage palm obviously died of lethal bronzing disease and then a bunch of healthy ones and then two dead ones. And then, you know, like a, it's just a hit or miss, very, very random. But the cabbage palm is, is really one of the, uh, favorite, if you will, um, palm species for this vector. Uh, the other palm that sadly is taking a big hit is the uh, Phoenix sylvestris, the wild date palm. The reason why I say sadly is because that is a high value palm. And just in talking to uh, landscape professionals and arborists, they do confirm, yes, that they're seeing this a lot on wild dates and cabbage palms in particular. Uh, this list, of course, is likely to expand once again as the disease um, becomes more established, probably in South Florida, because there are more palm species there. So um, watch this space is kind of that, that news. So how does lethal bronzing disease kill a palm? This is important to know because the symptoms reflect um, how the tree is being attacked. So what happens is this phytoplasma basically clogs up the phloem. The phloem is that vascular tissue and, or vascular system within the palm that carries the carbohydrates and the nutrients to the, the actively growing parts of the palm. And um, what happens is, the, so the, the, the reason why you see oldest leaves dying first in lethal bronzing disease is because those of you from your palm nutrition classes know that if there is a, a nutrient deficiency of, of micro, um, um, macronutrients, they will translocate from the old leaves to the new leaves. That's because the palm is trying to keep that new growth going. So that's exactly what happens with lethal bronzing disease. The phloem that carries all of those lovely nutrients and sugars are not getting to the top of the tree. So the tree is snatching nutrients from the lower fronds, the older fronds. The other thing that you can see this is this bottom picture is a cross section of the bottom part of a trunk of a diseased palm. And this shows the decay sort of at or near ground level. Um, I had a cabbage palm in my landscape that had lethal bronzing and it was in a group of a bunch of others and it was kind of hard to spot the canopy. I thought the canopy more leaves were dying than normal, but I wasn't quite, whoops, I wasn't quite sure. So I just took my hand and just shoved against the stem or the trunk of the palm and it was rocking back and forth. And that told me that there was decay at that lower part um, of, the, uh, of, the, of the stem. 
Now, regardless, the symptoms in lethal bronzing are the same, regardless of the species. So this is kind of happy when you're trying to diagnose. The first thing that happens is your flower, your flower stop, your flowers die, and you have premature fruit drop. Next, you see this bronzing coloration of the oldest leaves. And we'll look at pictures of all of these in a minute. Then the bronzing moves up the canopy, affecting the newer leaves. And at this point, when the tree is about 50% dead, the spear leaf will die and collapse. You will notice there will still be some live fronds left, usually at the top in the newer area of the canopy. And then the fifth step is what Dr. Bader calls the woodpecker phase. The, where the top just falls off. I, I don't know why, he I think he calls it woodpecker because it looks like a telephone pole. I mean, I'm not really sure. Um, the progression from infection to death, quite fast, eight to nine months. The progression from the time you might see some symptoms to the time of death, two to six months. And it varies by species, of course. Um, for some reason, queen palms, the, um, the Phoenix DAC, the Medjool date palm, and the Carpentaria palms. It lingers longer. The disease lingers longer. They live longer. We don't know why. All right, so here's uh, to go through these, the sequence of these symptoms once again. The inflorescence necrosis basically means that the flowers die before they go to seed. The premature fruit drop, this picture here is of uh, an Adenidia, a Christmas palm so named because of course the fruit turns red around Christmas time. So you see multiple fruit stalks on this tree. The one in the middle of course is ripe, the red is ripe, the green is unripe. If you see the unripe fruit on the ground around this tree, that is a symptom of lethal bronzing disease. This is a tricky, tricky phase because the, the tree has to be in flower or fruit for this to happen obviously. So this, you may not ever see this. But here's, here's the second phase, is the bronzing of the oldest leaves. Now you're going to see more necrotic, more dead older leaves than normal. And the issue here is, Master Gardeners, if you have a, if you have a customer that has removed dead, dying, and God forbid live fronds from that tree, you will, they have removed symptoms. You may never know that it has or has not, does not have lethal bronzing disease. Um, I can tell you that if they, uh, if they were to do hurricane pruning, God forbid, and remove a number of green leaves, uh, as in the case with my queen palm, I said earlier, the, the palm is more likely to die of a nutritional deficiency than of LVD. The third phase is where you see it start to move up through the canopy. Um, the picture on the, on the left is, shows you that early stage, that's the bronze of the oldest leaves, and then the picture on the right is a, is a palm tree, uh, another cabbage palm, where now the newer leaves are fully engaged in that canopy. This distinctive, very distinctive line of dead fronds, this is like screams LBD right here, this picture on the left. Um, and then on the picture on the right, I, it's kind of confusing because there's two palms here. There's one here, that's a cabbage palm, there's another cabbage palm. This is normal senescence. This is what a normal dead leaf looks like. It takes on kind of that gray, browny color. This is distinctively different in color. It's, it's very bronze colored. And you can see that this is moving up into the newer parts of the canopy. And I'm just now noticing there's a ladder in this picture I haven't seen before. So that makes me wonder, because when I first saw this picture, I noticed there's not a lot of old leaves. So I wonder if this person is pruning off dead leaves, and that's why we don't see as many dead leaves as we should. So that's removal of symptoms. We don't like that. <laughs> Again, bronzing moving up through the canopy. You can see the, the first half of that, the bottom half of that lollipop is definitely dead, and now you're seeing it starting to affect the newer growth. The spear leaf will die and collapse as the next step. I mean, pretty quickly, that when about 50% of the canopy is gone or dead, the spear leaf will, will die. And, that, and so that's the spear leaf right here on this cabbage palm that's dead. And on this queen palm to the right, I don't even see a spear leaf. So that's, that's been history a long time ago. But notice there's still green fronds in both of those. Um, it kind of makes sense about the, um, the spear leaf collapsing at this point. Remember. Again, remember that we said that um, this phytoplasma affects the carbohydrate transportation. 
in it within the palm. And so the carbs cannot now get to the areas where there's active growth, meaning the new leaves in that apical meristem. So that kind of makes sense, that, that progression. Again, this is a dead spear leaf right here. And you can see that um, there's still green, green uh, fronds in that, in that crown. Then you get the, uh, I call this the, uh, the nest. <laughs> it looks just like a bird's nest. Or you get this like fringe of just completely dead. And this is a very common sight, unfortunately, at least in our county, central Florida especially, you see a lot of this. Just driving around, look at people's yards or, or out in the countryside, you see these, these a lot. And then we get to our woodpecker phase. So. Um, so here's a couple of tips on how LBD differs from fungal disease. The highlighted yellow uh, leaves in these canopies are dead. That's the dead part. So in LBD on your left, the LBD is a distinctive layer of dead leaves in the canopy and the death of that spear leaf early on, early in the process. Ganoderma butt rot, another fatal disease I referred to earlier, definitely also has kind of, takes on a bronze coloration in those lower dead leaves, but the rest of the canopy might show a regular patterns of necrosis or discoloration. And that's how you can kind of tell the difference. Ganoderma is a very cryptic disease. It's very hard to diagnose unless certain things happen, which I won't get into right now. But um, it's, it's one of those things that if you look and you see kind of sporadic mosaic effect, I think Dr. Bader calls it, a pattern of, of necrosis in the canopy that might be Ganoderma. Definitely not lethal bronzing disease. The other fungal disease that we have, a fatal disease, is Fusarium wilt, which gets on, um, luckily the host list is quite small. It's queen palms, canary island date palms, and Mexican fan palms. That disease uh, progresses from the bottom of the, of the crown to the top, but the spear leaf is the last leaf to go in the canopy. Also, the inflorescence stays healthy when it has fusarium. So that, that's kind of the difference between those three, um, those three le lethal diseases. So how does lethal bronzing disease spread? This is, the, uh, this is the University's Fort Lauderdale Research and Education Center. I think the footprint goes kind of like this. I've only been there twice, so I don't, not, not positive. But um, this has become, coincidentally, kind of the living lab for LBD. LBD is spreading actively in palms on the campus. They have huge, had, I should say, huge stands of very mature palms here. There are more palms here, palms here, palms throughout. And especially, I think this is the entrance. Yeah, especially at the entrance, there were some palms that are no longer there. There's also, interestingly enough, a little bit of foreshadowing for you here, uh, turf grass test plots at this campus. Now, what happened was back in about 2015, they started noticing lethal bronzing disease symptoms on stands of cabbage and queen palms at the entrance of the center and nowhere else. No other palm trees in the neighborhood, no other palm trees at the rear of the campus, just in this one area. And they kind of looked back and said, you know what, in 2014, we installed new St. Augustine turf grass in this area. Could there be a connection? Hmm, I wonder. Um, so yes, like I said, the disease is actively, actively spreading there. So Dr. Bader, about this time, um, joined, this, joined the, the team here and they set about trying to find out the vector. Now, this is an incredibly daunting task. I'm just still blown away by this whole process. Um, but what they were looking for was an insect in the hemeptera order. That's the, it includes true bugs. It's the piercing sucking insects. Uh, it is a huge, huge group of species. I mean, it is just amazing. Um, just a suborder, the suborder of leaf hoppers and plant hoppers alone has more species, I think, than all the reptiles, all the birds, all the mammals, all the amphibians on earth. It's incredible. But that's why Dr. Bader's the entomologist and not me. But anyway, 
So this order, of course, includes aphids, white flies, mealybugs, plant hoppers, grasshoppers, thrips, uh, tree hoppers, blah, blah, blah. They are known to vector pathogens. Now the suborder, I, you know, usually I'm pretty good at pronouncing these things, but I'm not even gonna attempt this one. Uh, the leaf hopper and plant hopper suborder is known to vector phytoplasms specifically. So when they set out to find this insect, I think they knew what they were looking for. They were looking for a leaf hopper or a plant hopper because that's where the phytoplasmas can be vectored. So they set out a bunch of st sticky traps, I think in about 14 locations on the campus there. And they took a population survey. Um, I think they did this for about 13 months. They uh, extracted DNA, amazing, to uh, identify the phyto presence of the phytoplasma. They found four uh, specific insects that uh, were on palm trees that were in the group that they were looking for, plant hoppers and leaf hoppers. Of the four, two tested negative. They did not carry the phytoplasma. Of the remaining two, one does not feed on palms. So it's kind of a foregone conclusion, right? That this is our, this is our strongest suspect. This little chappy, this is Haplaxius crudus, the American palm six id. Um, he's uh, very, very tiny. He about two tenths of an inch, like I said earlier, about four, four to five millimeters, I suspect. Uh, in, in adult, in his adult stage. Um, he feeds throughout the canopy of palms, amongst other things. And Haplaxis crudus um, was first reported in 2002 as the vector for lethal yellowing disease. Now lethal yellowing disease is again, a fatal disease caused by a phytoplasma. The phytoplasma that causes lethal yellowing is in the same taxonomic group as the one for lethal bronzing. They're different genetically, but they're in the same taxonomic group. Um, so that, that kind of raised suspicions that this guy could be it. But they're not 90, they're not 100% sure. And the reason is because for an insect to be a vector, he has to not only harbor the disease or the phytoplasma, but he has to be able to retransmit it. And in order for that to happen, he's got a munch, 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 on an infected, on infected tissue or tissue containing the phytoplasma, it has to go uh, be absorbed outside, you know, in, into his body outside of the midgut. And then from there, it has to go to his salivary glands. So they are now in the process of screening Haplaxius crudus uh, salivary glands for the LBD phytoplasma. I can't even imagine how that happens. I mean, it's mind boggling, but anyway. So, um, so that's the story of Hyplaxis crudus. Now, uh, you'll be happy, I guess, to hear that whilst these individuals are very abundant out there in, in nature, um, oh, less than 1% of the uh, of Hyplaxis crudus uh, guys that he sampled had the phytoplasma. So very, very small percentage were actually, uh, you know, had the, had the phytoplasma present uh, in their DNA. Now, here, go back to the foreshadowing. Yes, Haplaxis crudus nymphs in one of their immature stages feeds on St. Augustine grass, as well as other grassy weeds, as well as other turf grasses. So um, what is not clear, real clear, is whether how Haplaxis crudus spends its life cycle. Do they spend it like in the palm tree, the complete life cycle after nymph stage in, in palms? Do they vector it from infected palm to uninfected palm? or is there a, a host reservoir in turf grass? So those are questions that we still don't know the answer to. Now, uh, to be completely certain, to be completely certain that you have uh, lethal bronzing on a palm tree or not, tissue sampling is pretty much imperative. Um, and this is something for you master gardeners out there to, you can offer it to your homeowner customers. You know, you can say, if you wanna make, make real, real sure, you can absolutely take a tissue sample, send it off to the university and get it confirmed or denied that it has the lethal bronzing disease. Um, and obviously collecting good samples is the first and most important step in managing it. Now, um, I'm not gonna go through the process here and how that's done. There is a publication describing that. But I guess the point is that not every homeowner is going to want to take this step. 
uh, because not every homeowner is going to want a hole in their, in their tree. And um, it's one of those things that you can pretty much tell by symptoms uh, that, that it does have lethal bronzing. But you know, in, in my last five years or so, I'd say I maybe had two customers that wanted their, their, their homes tested for this, even though looking at pictures, you know, we could tell that definitely they, it had it. But I think their rationale was they were high value palms and they wanted to make darn sure that that's what it was before they removed them. Um, but on the other hand, it is good hygiene to test healthy palms, or I should say asymptomatic palms, palms without any symptoms. Because if you have, for example, let's say a Canary Island date palm in your landscape where there have been canary, other Canary Island date palms that have succumbed to lethal bronzing disease, you might want to test it to see if it has, has the phytoplasma or not. Um, again, this is asymptomatic trees, trees with no symptoms yet. If it tests negative, well, you could start a course of antibiotic as a preventative. If it does test positively, you probably want to get it out of that landscape as soon as possible. You want to get it out of that environment as soon as possible. Um, a couple things to point out here, uh, Dr. Bader recommends you select a location on a trunk approximately two feet above ground level. And the reason for that is because the phytoplasma concentrates in the lower part of the stem and also the top of the stem. Now, obviously on a mature palm, getting to the top of the stem is not gonna be very practical. So right at the base of the trunk is probably the best place to take it from. Um, and then of course, you always want to seal that drill hole. Uh, you know that, of course, in palms, uh, trunk wounds never heal. You don't want to leave an open wound there. Now, how many samples do we take? Okay. Uh, Dr. Bader and his team and predecessors uh, tested, uh, took, a, took cross sections of symptomatic palms, cut them in big sections, and then uh, on a circumference basis, took eight samples around each one of these cross-sectional chunks, and they found that on the symptomatic palms, LBD tested positively in every single cross-section of the trunk. So that tells, tells us that one sample will, su will, will suffice. Now, I have talked to some landscaper professionals that go, you know, I take two just to make sure. Okay, whatever. On a palm that is asymptomatic, however, uh, the distribution of the phytoplasma is uneven, so more samples are required. So now we're talking multiple holes around a circumference, around you know, low on the trunk of that palm. Not something that every everybody wants to do, um, but that's what you know. If you really want to know if the tree has it or not, that's what needs to be done. Uh, there's a uh, to submit samples, you can download this form uh, from the uh, EDIS website, um, the University of Florida Electronic Data Information System website. And there's just two things to point out here. Uh, the first is that there is, oops, sorry. There are three levels of testing from least sensitive to most sensitive. And the price reflects that. So $75 is the minimum you're going to pay per sample. And they don't take credit cards. So you can't get any points, sorry about that. Um, in talking to uh, professionals, arborists and so forth, they tell me that this is a pretty quick turnaround. They usually get results within a week. So that's, that's the good news on that. Um, now trunk sampling is not always practical. If you're a grower and you've got multiple, multiple trees, you don't wanna be putting holes in them because you're gonna, you wanna try to turn around and sell those at some stage. So, you know, trunk testing for growers is not a great option. Also, you see that poor little coconut palm at the bottom there. He's so immature, he hasn't developed a trunk yet. So there is no trunk to test. So the question that came up was, can we test leaf tissue? And the answer is yes. This, uh, the picture on your, well, that's a chart on your left, but the picture on the right is leaflets taken from leaves of a single individual, uh, in this case, queen palm. And A through G reflects A being oldest, G being newest. So A is the oldest dead leaf in the canopy, B is the next level, C, D, E, F, and G is the spear leaf. 
So they tested each one of those. So you can see the, the key over here. So A is the naturally senescing leaf, B is a dead bronze colored symptomatic leaf, then C and D are dying leaves, E and F up there in the canopy showing no symptoms, and then the spear leaf. And of all of those levels, only the spear leaf tested positively for the LBD phytoplasma. Dramatic, dramatic. Now, here is a case of a multiple spear leaf chap. This is Phoenix Robolini, it's a fast grower. This is the pygmy date palm. These are the actual leaves themselves, again, from one individual tree. And this shows from A to G, oldest to newest. And so they tested, and on the oldest naturally senescing leaf, no sign of the phytoplasma. On the dead bronze colored symptomatic leaf B, next level up in the canopy, no. C, no. Oh, wait, wait, we have four spear leaves here. You told me there was only one. No. Well, what happens is, of course, that there are, there's the newest spear leaf, the true spear leaf, which is G, and then secondary, tertiary, and quaternary spear leaves. These are leaves that are still developing. They are still attached to the apical meristem. They all tested positive for the phytoplasma. So this has huge implications, obviously. <laughs> Um, so the phytoplasma is only present in leaf tissue directly connected to the apical meristem, okay? That means that the spear leaf is the likely source of acquisition by the vector. Now that has huge implications. Um, it kind of makes sense, again, because the, the, the sugars in the, in, the, in the phloem are traveling to the actively growing or actively developing part of the palm. And that's going to be the spear leaf and in the apical meristem, not in the older leaves. Um, another implication of this is that it does provide, of course, additional sampling options for us. In terms of tissue samples, you can test just from a leaflet alone. Also, if you're sampling for insect vectors, we know now, just let's stick to the spear, the spear leaf section. Yeah, the spear leaf is where we're likely to find the vector. And then for control, again, control options. Uh, maybe there's a way to protect the spear leaf so that no vector can get to the spear leaf until it fully develops or is no longer attached to the apical meristem. Maybe we can treat the insect just in that, on the spear leaf area. And then, of course, the biggest implication is to remove the palm while the spear leaf is still alive because it may help prevent the spread. You wanna get that, uh, that uh, phytoplasma present out of the environment as quickly as you can. This is very tricky, obviously, especially, I mean, it's, it's basically this, we're talking about a control in a nursery setting. Not, this is not gonna be controlled in a landscape. It just happens too fast and, um, you know, by the time, by the time, a, 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 you know, a customer or even a homeowner or even a master gardener really takes a cold, cold hard look at this thing, it might be too late. That spear might already be dead. So the management, basically, where we're saying, again, remove palms displaying symptoms and or testing positively for LBD that must be done before the spear leaf dies. And then you you know, like I said, good hygiene would dictate that you test asymptomatic palms in the area. If they test positive, remove them. If they test negative, you can start preventive injections with OTC, which is oxytetracycline, on healthy palms. I'm not going to say too much about oxytetracycline right today, but just it is, it is something that's been used successfully on lethal yellowing and uh, for prevention, only for prevention, this will not cure at all. But the jury is still kind of out on lethal bronzing disease, whether this is gonna do a true prevention job. I was speaking to, a, to a, uh, an arborist last week and he said, you know, when I inoculate uh, healthy palms, he said, if, I, if, if, they, if they're still alive after about a year, a year and a quarter, a year and a half, I pretty much think that the tree is gonna be out of the woods in terms of getting LBD. Um, but uh, like I said, the jury is, is still out on that. The dosage amount is complete, is just, we don't know what is really the correct dosage. At, this, at the uh, center, they're, they're doing research on mega dosing to see if that will make a cure uh, possible, but they really don't know the, the correct dosage on this stuff. So it's all very kind of experimental at this point. And of course, 
these injections are for the life of the poll. So it's not just once and done, it's every four months they think is the right time period to do this um, on, on these palms. Also in talking to some professional people, they said that you know, they've offered to, to, uh, to their homeowner or their customer to test asymptomatic palms, you know, just to see, if, make sure that they're gonna be safe or can we do these injections? And they said, you know what, people honestly don't really care. You know, it's one of those deals that the, test, the testing can be expensive and uh you know they said that the palm gets it it gets it it dies whatever you know it's not it's not that big of a deal so that's all i have for you today i just want to point out a couple of three uh good um edis publications again for those of you who aren't familiar with edis it is the electronic data information system of the university of florida if you just google uf edis it will take you there and you can plunk into the search box, either the name, the descriptive name here, or the publication number. The PP243 is the updated uh, lethal bronzing uh, publication with all of these, uh, with all the information I just gave you now, or most of it in, is in there. And then there is a publication on sampling palm tissue for lethal yellowing, and you can tell the age of this publication, Texas Phoenix Palm Decline. And then lastly is how to apply the oxytetracycline um, injections. So that's all that I have. Back to you. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, we had a couple of questions in here um, that I think would be good for the whole group. Just a question about, um, Amy, do you know what exactly it is about the phytoplasma that causes the discoloration in the dying leaves, why it has that distinctive bronzing color? No, it's probably because I don't know specifically. No, but what we could, what we conject, what we talked about at the summit was there might be something to do with how the phloem is affected uh, that is causing that. In other words, it's not it's not a normal death where you would see uh, nutrients translocating to older parts of the palm, and that causes a certain coloration. Whereas this is a quite fast death of the of the palm leaf, so that might be why it it has that color. Okay. And um, when samples are taken from the trunk, you mentioned that, um, you know, those uh, drill holes should be filled or sealed. How is that done? With a golf tee. I'm not joking. <laughs> a golf tee. In fact, if you were to, if you were to um, apply injections, if you did the OTC injection, which is another instance in which you have to drill holes, you can buy a kit online and they come with, spe with specially manufactured little things. They look just like golf tees. <laughs> All right, and then the last question, um, oh, we have a few more actually. Um, so if you're, let's say you're collecting samples of leaf material, and this is, a, this is in general, I think, if you suspect some kind of a disease in your palm and you're collecting tissue samples, what's a good way to dispose of any excess material that you have? Well, if, if the spear leaf is still alive, <clears throat> the phytoplasma might still be alive in that spear leaf, but once it is dead or removed, the phytoplasma does not survive. So there is no, it, it's not like a fungal thing that you're going to have it persisting in the soil or anything like that. The phytoplasma has to have a living host. Once the living host dies, it dies. Mm -hmm. A uh, question on the type of test that's done for the phytoplasma. Is it an antibody test, an antigen test? Do you know what they do? Do they look for the DNA of the phytoplasma in the tissue sample? Um, they do. They run a, I will tell you right now, it's a polymerase chain reaction. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Maybe somebody does, but, but that's what that PCR refers to on the form. Is a, is a polymerase chain reaction, which I, I believe is gene as, as a genetic yeah. test. Yeah, yeah. I think they're, they're trying to detect the DNA of the phytoplasma in the tissue, yeah. it sounds like. <clears throat> um, someone is asking if they should suggest palm species known to contract LBD to clients who have lost palms on their property to LBD and want to replace them. So like if the queen palm dies, should they say, hey, you can plant another queen palm there? It's a, it's a gamble. I mean, you certainly can take that gamble. Uh, the, the question is, and, and this goes back to that, that question that we have about 
about H. crudus, whether he is vectoring from palm to palm or is he acquiring the phytoplasma from a, uh, you know, a reservoir host. So if he's still in the neighborhood and he is getting it from St. Augustine grass, say, you probably don't want to put a palm that has tested positive for LBD before in the landscape. Um, on the other hand, um, if you suspect that uh, it's just, if, if you suspect that you've got a big enough landscape that that might not factor into it, you could probably do that. But I, you know, personally, I never would recommend to a customer to replace a dead, you know, queen with, of LBD with another queen. Yep. And then um, a general question, yes, the recording will be available to everyone. What I'll do is I will, um, some folks have requested it specifically in the Q&A and for everyone else, I'll just go ahead and send it out to everyone who registered for the webinar to make sure that you have access to it. And then we'll also be sharing it via our social media. So if you're not familiar with our Facebook page, um, we do post a lot of videos and good um, information there. Uh, we'll post um, information about our uh, monthly Master Gardener, um, newsletter that actually Amy is our editor-in-chief for our garden bench uh, and we'll be um, sending out the link to our newest June uh, issue very soon. So keep your eyes out for that and please go ahead and email myself or uh, manatee.mg at gmail.com if you have any uh, specific questions and thanks for joining us today. Catch you later. <laughs>